There we go. Hello to everyone who's joining or on the webinar right now. Give it a few more moments to let people sign in and then we'll get started with the webinar. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name, welcome to today's webinar, Connecticut's Entrepreneurial Ecosystem, the Role of Our State. Thank you for taking the time for being here today. My name is John Schneider. I am a board member of Connecticut Entrepreneurs Forum, Forum and I'll be today's host. The Connecticut Entrepreneurs Forum recently changed its name uh, our former name was the MIT Enterprise Forum of Connecticut. Over the next several months, we will be providing a series of events on the Connecticut entrepreneurial ecosystem to share important knowledge, experience, and expertise. In today's webinar agenda, we will be covering the first event of the series and taking a look at the, our state and its role in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, other topics that we plan on bringing you this spring will include developing entrepreneurs, funding, and finding talent. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the chat box in the Zoom control panel. We will address questions at the end of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. Again, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to, um, to join us. And I would like to um, thank our sponsors uh, up on the slide for uh, helping us make today's program uh, possible. And with that, I would like to open up today's webinar. We are very lucky to have with us today three members of the Connecticut State uh, ecosystem to discuss the topics. We have Tony Roberto, Manager, Managing Director of Strategic Investments at Connecticut Innovations. Oni Obioka, Executive Director, CT Next. And David Noble, Assistant Professor in Residence, Associate Professor in Residence at UConn and director of the Peter J. Worth Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And with that, thank you, Tony. Uh, would you like to lead us off with an introduction of what you do and who you are? Sure, thank, thank you for uh, having me. Uh, my name is Tony Roberto. I actually, I work as you indicated for Connecticut Innovations, but I, I actually spend a preponderance of my time working at uh, the combination of DECD, and I'm sort of the bridge between Connecticut Innovations and Department of Economic and Community Development, often working on a variety of special projects, everything from legislation that is being targeted to uh, helping develop programs, um, big and small projects across the board. 
uh, and have been doing that for some time. Uh, previously, I was the executive director of the old Connecticut Development Authority that was merged into Connecticut Innovations. Um, we operated the Excel Center, as you may recall from back then, as well as we were a loan and, and an investment making body. Uh, currently, all of those activities exist under Connecticut Innovations. And uh, I've been doing these special projects work for a combination of DECD, Connecticut Innovations, and Governor's Office now for probably the last 10 years. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Oni, could you take a few moments to tell us about yourself and your new role? Yeah, happy to. First off, thank you all for having me today. Uh, excited to be a part of this conversation. And and you know, offer some insight, insights and gain from a lot of the other panelists as well. Um, my name is Onieko Biacha. I go by Oni. I'm a full-time Connecticut resident, born and raised in Connecticut, and I'm the newly minted executive director of CT Next, um, Connecticut's entrepreneurship and innovation arm. Um, we'll get into it a bit more during the panel discussion, but our, our idea and my idea of what we do at CT Next is really helping entrepreneurs through a continuum of care Right, so really going from ideation to implementation and making sure they have the human capital, relational capital, social capital and financial capital that they need to succeed. So again, thank you for having me here today and excited to continue the conversation. All right, David, how about you? Hello, I'm uh, David Noble. I'm the director of the Worth Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at UConn. Uh, we have over 60 member organizations or units within the University of Connecticut as part of Worth Institute that are focused on or support entrepreneurship. Um, you know, one of the things I think the, the most common misconception of what we do that we could correct here is we don't focus on startups at the Worth Institute. We focus on preparing people to be entrepreneurs or work within entrepreneurial companies and making sure they have the skills and competencies to contribute right away. All right. Thank you all again for your time and let's just jump right in. So, Tony, uh, if you could tell us a little bit uh, about what the state currently is doing uh, to develop the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Sure. So there's uh, well, first of all, let me start with something that's going on right now. There is a request out there for proposals. Um, for what is referred to as Express 2.0. And in that particular proposal, it is looking for innovative ideas from third parties. So effectively, we're looking for partners that are going to uh, focus on startups, all stages of development for a business, but also underserved communities that are in there. That, that is referred to as Express 2.0. This is the second part of it. And within that proposal, it's also going to have creative grant technical assistance potential programs. In particular, sometimes that finding the initial capital in those communities becomes extremely difficult. Uh, working backwards, the part that's already been done in Express 2.0 is that is in partner with outside organizations, uh, those are designed to develop or, or, or deliver loan type of products. Generally, product, the loan products are under 300,000. So these are small loans to uh, businesses. And the entity that's doing that is taking the state funding, matching it with private funding. And the organizations that are gonna be delivering those funds are organizations like Harford uh, uh, Headco, Harford Economic Development Corporation and, and et cetera. So working with third parties, oftentimes those are people that are already heavily engaged in the communities that they're working in. Um, effectively is a change from where we were, where DECD was previously doing some of those things. So, so, so some of those in developing the entrepreneurial ecosystem is working through, through third parties, um, also supporting organizations such as uh, CCAT, Reset, and we can go down through a lot of those lists, but those organizations are also designed to help entrepreneurial, including technical assistance through some organizations like small business development um, 
Corp, uh, CBDC, those are, that's supported by the state of Connecticut as well as the federal government. Those provide resources for companies that are looking to get started. And then I'll leave some of the other things that are happening to uh, CT Next because um, you know that may be better explained by uh, Anya on, on the phone call, but, but a lot is going on in this area. And the other part that people forget is that we're also trying to build the infrastructure that is necessary for these organizations. And one example is that we were heavily involved and I, had, I was heavily involved in the development and the state is involved in the development of 101 College Street as an example. And in part of 101 College Street, there's gonna be 50,000 square feet of incubator lab space. So, you know, the entrepreneurials not only benefit from direct assistance, but they also benefit by the fact that we're able to provide the infrastructure they need to get started. All right, thank you very much for that. Oni, so what, what's CT Next's role in supporting the entrepreneurial ecosystem? Um, how do you work with the state? What's the intention there? Yeah, so I think for folks who don't know, it's important to note that CT Next was founded in 2016 uh, through a legislative act, and we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Connect Innovations. So Tony's house, my house, we work close together to understand what are the full needs of the entrepreneurs and innovators in the state of Connecticut. So in terms of our work with the state, it's a number of different ways. Obviously working with DCD, working with Advanced CT, work with CBIA, I mean, again, I started this job January 14th, and it's just been alphabet soup ever since. Um, but to be honest with you, I've been re really excited about the people who've been stepping up and the individuals that I've been meeting who are really excited about understanding the state's role in helping entrepreneurship and innovation. So when I think about the state's role it's, and CT's role within the state, it's about looking one at our urban cores, primarily Hartford, New Haven, Stanford, New London slash Broughton area and provide the opportunities to really show up the advanced sectors and the core drivers in that region. Hartford Insurance, Stanford Technology, New London Broughton, kind of blue tech, green tech, and then New Haven Biotech. And since 2016, CTNEX has an incredible job in helping those core sectors become resilient, more innovative, and understand that we can work with them on the micro level, so we're not building out infrastructure at 101 College, but we'll help program it through our relationship with individuals and actors in that region. So that's how we've been doing it for the past five years. And I think now we're really in a situation where what are the secondary and tertiary benefits of having a robust entrepreneurial ecosystem and how do we invest in that? So understanding that we're always gonna support our high growth sectors, but also really interested in what are the coffee shops and what are the other kind of um, resources that we can have, whether it's about placemaking, whether it's about uh, work and play aspects of live work play, uh, the other ecosystem elements that can really provide certain robustness and that we can continue to attract and retain talent, but also have an opportunity to provide the resources for any entrepreneur and innovator to be able to build a business or a project that fits their specific needs for themselves and their community. So that's on the state level, we're really just trying to, as much as it's about infrastructure and programming, also capture hearts and minds in this next iteration of CT Next to really allow more folks at the table. Excellent, thank you. David, so we've heard from two people about the benefits. Is it really important that the state participates in the development of an entrepreneurial ecosystem? Oh, David, I can't hear you. Yes, for sure. I mean, there, there are caveats to that, right? I mean, you have to actually improve the ecosystem and, you, and specifically the infrastructure. Um, and, and I think in this case, uh, Connecticut being the case we're talking about, it's, it's incredibly important because there's a hyper-localization of of markets. I, I mean, I see uh, Suprio from Hartford here. Uh, you know, I see people from Stanford, from New Haven in the in the attendee list, and 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 many of those different people never meet each other, never know each other because they think they live in different worlds. O only, uh, you know, 
only to get the critical mass. I mean, you know, we have to find a way to build critical mass of competencies and, and, and resources around infrastructure um, to compete on a global scale. And I think our hyper-local approach uh, fails uh, on, a, on a global level. Um, and so that, that's the, the key. And the state is the only actor that truly has an incentive to drive that, that, that hyper-localization away and think about Connecticut as a, as a global uh, entity. Okay, excellent. Tony, so what what types of entrepreneurship does the state support? Um, are we talking Main Street, tech base, social enterprise? Well, you know, I think when people oftentimes uh, use the word entrepreneurial, they think about the tech space, and and clearly, the state has uh, it does a lot of work in that area, and in particular, Connecticut Innovations does a lot of work in that area. It 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 provides funding for those companies, startup companies, oftentimes in the form of equity, sometimes in loans, convertible loans, as well as angel investment tax credit, but. But that's why we have multiple organization. In the case of DECD, it is also much more broadly defined, right? In, in other words, an entrepreneurial could be a company in Hartford that is, or, or a company anywhere that is, um, is somewhat traditional in nature. It may not have the kind of technology that um, uh, requires patent, but it doesn't mean they're not innovating within that business. I think we're seeing it now, like a lot of restaurants, for example, have become very innovative in how they deliver product and how they deliver services. So what we, you know, it's not a one size fits all. It's important that you build, I think somebody, I think it was a reference to the ecosystem. As we build the ecosystem, that it has to be an ecosystem where people want to work, you know, people have uh, recreation, want to play and having run the Excel center, you know, sometimes I was wondering what's a value proposition? Well, people don't want to go to a place when there's nothing to do. So it's important, but the people that are providing those services, those people are also entrepreneurs in what they're doing. That's why you have different programs. Like for example, the Express 2.0 that is being talked about now, that's not necessarily just targeting the, the company that is high tech, that is uh, in the bioscience area, but it's, it's, it's really talking about targeting all of the companies that make up the entire ecosystem that makes Connecticut a great place to live, work, and play, so to speak. Not that I created that, but that's been out there for a long time. If we can't attract talent because we have all of those ancillary activities, then no matter, you, you just don't have the, you can't develop those entrepreneurial tech companies if you can't attract talent to the state. So a lot of work goes into making sure that we have all the pieces together that attracts that talent. So a lot of investment goes into infrastructure. A lot of investment goes into workforce training. A lot of investment goes into being able to attract people to where from to Connecticut, right? And also a lot has to go into keeping the talent that we have. As for example, kids graduating from UConn stay in Connecticut, kids graduating from Yale or young adults, I should say, stay in Connecticut. If you look at the statistics from the community college, most of those people and, and also the state college system, most of those people that are going to those places stay in Connecticut. So we got to, 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 to keep that up, we have to keep working on finding ways to keep them here and, and keeping them here oftentimes involves having job opportunities and, and growth opportunities. All right, thanks. Oni, so CT Next, uh, are you focused, I mean, you talked about this a little bit in your last answer, but are you focused on certain aspects of the ecosystem? Um, is that shifting? Um, and which ones are you focused on? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, we're focused on, yes, we're focused on certain aspects. Uh, we're primarily focused on innovation and entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial companies, partic particularly potentially high growth companies. Um, I think oftentimes in previous ways, again, as I spoke to before, that looks like really shoring up the core economic drivers in our urban cores. But now I think we're having a broader conversation as to what does innovation 
entrepreneurship mean? And for Tony's point too, how do we provide an opportunity to really cultivate a robust <laughs> entrepreneurship innovation ecosystems, really leveraging and using a lot of the resources that we have in the state, right? I tell folks all the time, Connecticut, everything Connecticut needs to be successful, it already exists here. But for some reason, we're 169 towns that act like 200 that don't know how to attract our resources, cultivate them, even on the regional level, to deploy them in a way that's most helpful for the entrepreneurs and innovators on the ground. So I say that to say, when I'm thinking about specific aspects, it's also about now at this point in 2022, broadening out and understanding with the cannabis legislation that passed, what is a robust entrepreneurial driven cannabis ecosystem look like, right? We also think about a lot of different ways where we think about economic development, inclusive economic growth. We also think about creative economy, right? The ESPN is one of the largest sectors in the greater Hartford region as its own organization. How are we doing, what are we doing to really attract entrepreneurs and innovators to be able to have a role either as a vendor or as an employee to, again, to Tony's point, attracting and retaining talent for an organization like ESPN. And even in doing so, how do we have the opportunity to leverage the amazing talent over at Lego and Enfield that can come in and also provide support to our ecosystem as well? So it's those things where, you know, yes, we're the high growth, yes, we're entrepreneurship, yes, we're innovation broadly, but there's so many ways for CT Next to imagine interventions in all those ways that's entrepreneurial driven and can support them as a whole. So, I mean, it's across a variety of different sectors, a variety of different areas, but I think our focus is really on making sure that we can attract or retain amazing businesses, amazing talent, and give people the resources that they need to succeed, knowing that they're the ones who define their own success. All right. David, what's your take on what's needed? You know, I, I think you need a you need a thriving workforce in in, in cities that people want to live in. I mean, it, it's really a, a pretty simple equation at the end of the day. Um, I, I've heard different, you know, being a resident of Stanford, I've heard taxes are too high in Connecticut. I've heard rent is too high or housing is too high. And it's like, well, I mean, Brooklyn and San Francisco have done pretty well with with developing their tech sectors and entrepreneurial sectors at, at significantly higher rates on both housing and um, taxes. So, you know, uh, focusing on the things that we do have and, and, you know, someone I was talking to yesterday, I said, well, how'd you, I said, how'd you find West Hartford? And he said, I was Googling best places to raise a family, right? And he found West Hartford and now he's building a business in West Hartford uh, instead of LA. Um, you know, and, the, and they were escaping LA. So, I mean, using our strengths to do that while also developing very clear tech talent pipelines that affect the skills uh, demanded to build products in the entrepreneurial sector is uh, paramount. All right. So Tony, when you do these, set up these programs, what are you doing to, uh, I guess, measure how successful they are? Well, you know, interestingly that as we look at programs oftentimes measured by um, the legislation that is uh, authorizes them and creates them does focus on sort of job creation, right? And, and so we sort of go into that bucket, job creation. And if you were doing econometric modeling, such as we use Remy models, some people will use uh, implant models. Uh, one of the major drivers of a Remy model is infrastructure um, development, as well as jobs. So the, you know, the, the jobs and the payroll component of it, those are measurable. When you're in the entrepreneurial field, though, I would also like to point out that churning is extremely important, meaning that, you know, it's not about that one company that succeeds, it's that you're constantly churning a lot of company into the funnel, and, and one spits out. But when you have, when you're going into that funnel, there's a lot of investment that comes in. So you may have 20 companies, two of them become really successful. But in the meantime, you've had $20 million worth of investment that's occurred. So that's sort of critically important. We're always looking at those components of it. Focusing on jobs is primarily what we do. 
but it's also about other things and looking at programs such as Brownfields Redevelopment Program. You know, that, that's extremely important to the urban core. Oftentimes, whether we like it or not, that brownfields are, are a product of the urban core and the old industrial economies. For example, in Eastern Connecticut, it could have been the mills that existed out there. In Hartford, it could be the gun maker that was there. Those, those kind of um, activities are important to build that infrastructure. So not you can't measure it just on jobs. You also have to measure is on the fact that we put property back to use, productive use, and, and all the companies that locate there become part of the, the economic driver that is, is, is going on. When we're looking at bigger deals in Connecticut, we are generally focused on the econometric value proposition. And, and, and those big deals across the board, anything that the state gets involved in that it supports above a half a million, we would generally run an econometric model. In our case, we happen to use a REMI models, which is a dynamic model versus an end plan model that is not dynamic. So we are looking at what how the state gets value out of it all the time. But we, we don't focus on any one thing. We focus on that, I should say, but we also want to take into consideration all of the other benefits that occur. So if we're investing in an enterprise zone, that may be very different than investing, for example, in a thriving uh, whether Greenwich or Stanford or, or other locations. So even within Stanford, there are pockets where the investment, uh, such as uh, on the south side of 95, where that at one time was considered an enterprise zone. In Hartford, you know, there are certain places that are considered enterprise zone. You have opportunity zone. All of those become a part of the measuring that we're doing. And it also drives why we would have certain incentives going into those areas or have enhanced incentives. So we, we've created a Jobs Connecticut. It, they were referring to it as Grow CT. It's currently making its way through the legislature. We're currently using it as, as a, a part of the Manufacturing Assistance Act, which is funding that DECD has. And one of the things that we're doing in there is that when we have job growth, you're getting grants and arrears for that job growth. But the grants and arrears you would get in an enterprise zone and opportunity zones are higher than the grants and arrears that you would get in a non-zone. Again, going to what I think David is, you have to have a thriving sort of uh, hub that exists in particular in some of the urban cores. I think people mentioned Hartford, New London, New Haven, Stanford, um, you know, Waterbury may be also in that puzzle, but, but you know, all of that is always taken into consideration. And it's not done in a vacuum. I think people think we do things in a vacuum. It, it literally is never done in a vacuum. All right. Oni, so with CT Next, how are you going to define uh, what success is, um, both from what you do uh, in the ecosystem and you do as far as an organization? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So. I mean, this is a, a tough one for me to answer because entrepreneurial ecosystems are, you know, complex adaptive systems, right? So we have the hard kind of quantitative measures, right? We've deployed in the past five years around $44 million. We've had over 54,000 hours of mentorship. Uh, we've supported over 70,000 jobs. Over 300 companies have been uniquely, have been, 300 unique companies have been funded by CTNEX. So we are moving the needle on a lot of the numbers when we're thinking about organizations or think about dollars leverage, dollars deployed, jobs developed, right? And I think that's really important on the macro level. But on the micro level, something that's really a bit more difficult for us to measure is how, uh, how cohesive is the network? So if I'm an entrepreneur and I step down in Hartford and I talk to someone like Jasna at launch and I say, hey, Jasna, I really want to develop a business. Where do I go? Do we have the resources to help that individual entrepreneur navigate that pipeline? Or again, it's a continuum of care from the point that they have an idea to the point where that idea is developed and hopefully maybe funded by Tony over at CI. What are the ways in which they have the resource succeed? Those are the things that we're trying to really measure, the resilience and the cohesion of a network in particular geographies, right? Primarily the urban cores across Connecticut and also in sectors, 
if there is an individual who has an amazing biotech idea in Manchester, I don't want them to fail because they go to Hartford rather than trying to set up shop at the Vivarium in New Haven. It's those type of things that CT Next is really trying to dig into that on the ground, are we supporting the individual entrepreneur and the way that they execute their programming, their projects and providing the resources around them to do that at a high level. So, so David, when uh, someone who's not directly involved with the system wants to look and see progress, uh, one of the things we're, uh, it seems to me is that we're talking about longer time frames. So what is the appropriate kind of measure from an outside perspective of, of what success looks like? How long do we wait? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I, you, you know, you're talking about a political, you're, you're, you're asking for a political answer on, a, on an economic question, right? And yeah. so, you, you know, basically you have election cycles, which if I were working in the, in, in the environment, that's what I would be paired to. Um, and I think, you know, identifying what the victories are in the process uh, towards the, the tangible economic uh, benefits. When you're starting something really, really key, I, I think um, we, when we created the Worth Institute from nothing four years ago, it, it wasn't truly from nothing. It was, from, it was built on the shoulders of, of 20 years worth of work. Um, if you would have went around the state and asked them, is UConn uh, effective in, in training and preparing entrepreneurs, the answer would have been no resoundingly and we heard it from the legislature we heard it from organizations and then you know you know you you actually build the narrative show what you've done like previously and we were a ranked entrepreneurship program uh both like graduate and undergraduate and if you look at our alumni across the world you know some of the biggest companies in the world are founded by uconn alumni right and um but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily come up or um, in the conversation. So when you start thinking about metrics within the state, you, you really have to have a good set of process metrics on a long tail investment and identify what those are up front. And then you're able to watch it six months, nine months, 12 months, two oh. years. Um, but that presumes you have a, a, a clear vision for where you're going and, and how you're going to get there, right? And that's going to change over time. And I think one of the things that Oni and I have talked about in some of our early dialogue is the need for continually looking at this. It's a feedback loop, right? You got to go back to it and see, are we being, so talk about inclusion. Are we being inclusive? Today, probably not, right? Tomorrow, we're going to be better. I know that. But how are we going to look at it six to nine months down the road? Well, it, it, it requires work. I mean, that, that's at the end of the day. And continual adjustment, not rehauling strategy, but continual adjustment to the strategy to get better and better. And so process variables, uh, you know, election outcomes, uh, there, there's no way to do it otherwise. Um, and, and don't forget, these are lockstep improvements. So nobody knows about it until you make a significant uh, upward. It's not a linear growth chart, right? It's, it's full of this. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, that those are all really key to understanding how to measure success in this space. All right, thanks. Tony, I wanna to move on to uh, people in the state of Connecticut. And um, what are you doing to promote entrepreneurship or encourage entrepreneurship in state residents um, around Connecticut? Well, I I, I saw a question pop up from Don Kirschbaum that sort of leads into this is that um, it's, it's constantly evolving. We're doing this all the time, so it's not stagnant. So, you know, in the manufacturing side, for example, there's the Connecticut in, um, Manufacturing Innovation Fund, oftentimes providing small grant, grants through uh, CCAT and et cetera. But most recently, this is sort of apropos, it's not there yet, is the federal government did SSBCI, Small Business Credit Initiative. And we actually just finished the application, the federal government opened it up. And I just wanna point out that focusing on the entrepreneurship that those fund, the state of Connecticut potentially is gonna get $129 million from the federal government in three tranches. Uh, one of the focuses, for example, clean tech, 
right? We've all heard a little bit about clean tech. And so the governor, we're hoping to apply about 50 million of it to focus in on clean tech. And in part, having been involved in uh, wind procurement, a lot of that technology may revolve around wind, but a lot of the technology may revolve around other things that are happening in the marketplace at currently. So the other part of it is, is that there's also funding that is going, it's all gonna be administered through Connecticut Innovations that is also gonna focus in on um, underserved communities, for example, and how do we define those communities? So as part of that legislation, the federal legislation, there was very specific goals that we're trying to achieve to make sure that we're addressing the needs of those communities. And another 25 million in equity type of transaction is dedicated to that. In addition to that, there is other money is approximately 30 million. I, and my numbers may be low on the other because I because it's coming in two different tranches that'll be more invested in loans. So, you know, with all of that money coming in from the federal government, as an example, recently, we're targeting some of those entrepreneurial and how do we, how do, we're adding a lot more resources. And, and part of what's required is that legislation is also that there's matching funds. So the state can't do it alone, right? We wanna be able to leverage, if we're getting in a hundred million as, a, as an example, we wanna be able to leverage that hundred million. So the federal legislation requires you to leverage that at least one-to-one, -one. that's the minimum. But the goal is to measure, literally leverage it 10 times. Now, achieving 10 times can be difficult. And in some cases, one company by itself can achieve it just because you, you make an investment and it ends up a significant IPO and, and they raise hundreds of millions of dollars, you potentially would leverage those. But, but those are some of the things that we're doing. On the workforce is we have a whole unit that's dedicated. The governor has a uh, workforce development um, board. Uh, they, there's a whole unit that's just focusing on the workforce. If, I apologize for dog. We have a delivery person coming and she thinks she's getting treats. So the, UP, um, the UPS guy, oh, you know. He, yeah, they're they good they, to her. I mean, she they, knows which ones she loves and doesn't love. So they I know apologize. your webinar schedule. Yeah. So, the, but, but part of that, for example, I think people don't realize for the Eastern Connecticut Workforce Investment Board, they're doing a huge amount of training out there. The training for electric boat, a lot of their people are coming from there. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, the, the amount of resources and the focus on job training is very high. And, 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 you know, some things work better than other things. There is the community college systems. Um, there's um, in East Hartford, for example, when a university is heavily involved in workforce training, they just took over Bridgeport University, also likely to include a lot of workforce training, very nimble, being able to adapt very quickly to what's happening in the market. Case. Um, as we know, we have companies coming in looking for coders. The amount of energy going into having programs that help um, students develop coding skills is extremely important. All of that is always on the radar. It's part of what we want to do. And, and some of it is, you know, we're providing companies with a lot of technical assistance. So the, the application, for example, for the federal government, SBC, SBCI and the rules that are coming out within the next few weeks, the state will also be able to apply for funding for technical assistance. But in the meantime, part of the RFP that's out at DECD also is helping fund technical assistance for companies that, um, you know, because no one knows everything, right? You may need accounting technical assistance. You may be a great engineer or a scientist, but you're not a financial person. So all of that is becomes part of the ecosystem that's being worked on. And some of the things I'm talking about are in the pipeline. Some things already exist. So for example, Connecticut Innovations has executives in residence that are helping a lot of their companies. It may be that they need assistance with marketing. It may be the business development. It could be across the board. All of those are part of what uh, uh, DECD supports. Uh, and all of the other entities around DECD. So Connecticut Innovations does some things, CT Next would do other things. Obviously um, the workforce um, in, uh, that sort of runs separately does some of that. Uh, wind, they're sort of talking about a wind or 
clean tech czar or, or person that's coming in to focus in on wind and some of the specific needs associated and all of the work that's gonna be associated with building out and not just building these facilities. Keeping in mind is that you're gonna to have to maintain them for the next 25 or 30 years. All of those are opportunities that exist. And, it, and literally you're working sometimes on all of them at the same time. There is no one answer to it all. But the, the green tech component of it is very much always on the radar. As we have electric cars, people are gonna have to charge them. If you're living in an apartment, that's a lot harder to do. And that infrastructure all is gonna have to be built out in order to make it work. And the companies that are developing those technologies, some of them exist here in Connecticut. Some of the pioneers exist in charging technology in Connecticut. And, and I think finding a way to make sure that they're participants in all of this is also really important. Perfect, thank you. Oni, so what is CT Next doing um, to uh, raise up uh, Connecticut entrepreneurs? Yeah, so we have a lot of different initiatives. Um, really all our initiatives are for Connecticut entrepreneurs. You know, we folks that, Advanced CT, Anna Leland is on the call. Folks at Advanced CT do an amazing job of kind of bringing in outside corporations and organizations to come to Connecticut. So we're really focusing on what does it mean for people who are born and raised here, people who come here post-college or for college to stay and be able to have the resources that they need to be successful. So a lot of it's around funding, which I know will speak to um, how to moving forward, but there are other things like a robust mentor network. Uh, we provide opportunities for any and all businesses to come in, be a part of our net mentor networking game, some knowledge capital from a lot of our mentees or our mentors to our mentees. Um, we also provide a, a number of funding to different organizations across Connecticut. Risa and Hartford is one of them, uh, Haven and Stamford, the district, you know, CI's office is there and also looking at organizations in that place uh, that we provide resources to and that able to help entrepreneurs on the ground. Again, I'm thinking a lot more. January 14th just started, so really continue to wrap my head around this. But I'm thinking about a lot more about what it means for entrepreneurs in Connecticut to understand the resources that are at their disposal. I think that's the biggest thing. Honestly, a lot of the resources at CT Next, having been a part of the ecosystem for years in a variety of different areas, I still didn't I still didn't know a lot of the resources that CT Next has. So I'm the first person to tell you we have a huge marketing issue in terms of the information availability versus the information accessibility. And I think turning that corner and providing more resources or providing the resources in a way that more accessible to entrepreneurs, I think it's gonna really solve a lot of the gaps I see with entrepreneurs saying there's not enough funding available, there's not enough mentorship available, there's not enough um, infrastructure available, where it's like, yes it is, but it's not available to everyone. And I think CT Next, we have to leave our quote unquote home, our office, and really step out and meet the entrepreneurs where they are and bring them into these resources. They're not gonna come running if they don't know it, if they haven't been accessible to them, if our applications are too long or onerous. I mean, we really have to be a lot more effective and nimble in the resources that we're providing and how providing that. And that's absolutely a top priority moving forward. Excellent. David, so uh, you talked about what you've done at UConn to sort of improve uh, students to, to uh, work in an entrepreneurial environment. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, I think most, most universities do a, a very high level job of training students uh, the knowledge in a, in a specific area, um, whether that's areas finance, marketing, uh, technology, um, biotech, engineering, et cetera. Um, where, where the universities have, have typically fallen off over the last 25 years or so, and where companies have stopped investing is in the training of individuals for the skills ready to, to work in the workplace today. Historically, you went to university, you got an education, you then went to a job and they taught you what you were supposed to do on the job. Today, companies and entrepreneurial economies require students to graduate knowing exactly what they can give uh, and, and do right away. So we've spent a lot of time in building an additional and testing how, how to drive home those skills and competencies necessary to be a productive member of a team today. 
And, um, you know, we think about it as sort of entrepreneurship in the university as a second layer of an education where many of the things students learn get a chance to apply and execute. So for instance, in this space here that I'm at in Stanford, we have eight students full-time on co-op working and learning how to build products. So computer science or coding students, uh, as, as Tony mentioned, are in high demand, but they don't learn how to build a product in school. They learn how to write code or structure a database or do this. They don't work with designers in their classes because those students are in other classes on design where they're learning how to do design, which also has elements of coding that a computer scientist never gets. And then, you know, on the UX, UI, uh, you know, I see Don Taria on the call as well. And it's like, that's a whole nother area. What, what you're doing is designing a product for customers to actually use. And all of those things are really incredibly important to getting a product into the market. Uh, and so we've been trying to find ways to, to train students up at a higher level. And I think if you put 20 students a year into the Connecticut economy, just 20 that are really ready for this, you've caused a, a sea change because there weren't 20 students a year ready to contribute on building product. That's before you even get into the growth side of, of entrepreneurship, which is a, a whole nother ball game. So we're trying to dissect uh, job functions today, not in alignment with traditional majors because philosophy majors become technologists, right? And so that's our, that's our, our thought process uh, and how we do it. Excellent, thank you. Um, Tony, how are the funding decisions made well you know let me talk about it in the current sense that um the the one thing that is is the there's a few programs that are um sort of key right there's the bigger program so from infrastructure for example there is an urban reinvestment tax credit program that's really driven by econometrics it's literally modeled out you know, we have the ECD has a PhD that um, is our economist. We model it out through Remy. In the case of um, Grow CT, it's really grants and arrears for job creation. It's prescriptive in nature. It's 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 more objective decision versus subjective decisions, right? And and it's basically calculations that you're doing. When you're, you know, we've we've sort of backtracked a little bit and and on making loans. But so in the making of loans now, a lot of that is being done through partner organizations such as CEDF, um, um, which is uh, down in Meriden. Co, which is in Hartford, Connecticut Innovations is involved. Those are sort of credit decisions, right? There's, it's, there's a combination of objective factors in a credit decision as well as subjective factors. Pretty versed on this, I actually you know, created scoring models of it that were algorithmic in nature to determine that. But in the end, you can never take out the subjective components to it. There's always some level of thought. It's very difficult sometimes because you're making a decision as to whether or not certain things are achievable that are, are soft in nature, right? You're not just basing it on historical, but you're basing it also on where it's going. And you're making a determination as to whether the business that you're helping finance is actually going to be able to achieve what I refer to as sustainability. Sustainability doesn't mean you come back to the state for grants over and over again. It means that the building, the business can thrive on its own. And, and, and that's some of the goals that we have. There's, there's, I think one of the things going forward as we have third party and partnering with different organizations that, and you're trying to leverage state funding high, at higher risk, that some of those decisions will also be made by those third parties as to whether or not they want to invest private dollars into that company. So oftentimes we look at not just investing the state dollars, but you're looking at how much private investment is coming in. So the project doesn't look like a state project. It looks like a private project with that little extra that is needed to get it sort of over the hump. Um, you know, and it could be a very, for example, when you're investing in infrastructure, sometimes uh, private companies, there's limitations. The environmental cleanup is just 
too too hard too large for a private sector to get the kind of return on investment they're looking for and the state would have to step in to fill the gap. So the state becomes a gap filler versus uh, the driver of the financing. It's always done in conjunction with the private sector, almost across the board. Um, so I, I think that's the focus on it. I wish that sometimes you could give a simple answer where it's totally formulaic, but I don't think it's ever going to be totally formulaic. I think there has to always be a thought process, especially when you're it's constantly evolving. But I think moving forward, the goal at DECD is that it's more prescriptive in nature. It's more formulaic in nature with and funding is done in conjunction with partner organizations such as partner organizations that I'm, I'm talking about larger with the, with the grow CT, which is grants and arrears, you have to achieve it before you actually get funding. Um, and in some of the other project is we're helping build infrastructure, such as what we defined as 101 College Street, or, you know, the film and digital tax credits, which are um, designed to build infrastructure around digital media and, and film. You know, one of the things that we, I heard about ESPN, but you also have to create an ecosystem around them. So the old, one person told me that was running a, a furniture business, is, as I said, how do you survive? There's these furniture stores across the street. And, and he once told me that critical mass is what drives people to shop there. And if you go to a furniture store and you one furniture store in the area, and it's the only one in the area, you may be coming home with a big screen TV versus a couch. So, and if you look at some of the things that are going on, restaurants want to locate next to each other, right? If you have critical mass in restaurants, take a look at Middletown, very successful Main Street. You have a ton of restaurants up and down Main Street. That didn't exist 20 years, some odd years ago. Um, it's the same thing is true when your businesses, nobody wants to be sort of there alone, right? You create a critical mass of these companies, technology companies, people come, it, 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 take a look at Colorado as an example, the same kind of thing that you're trying to do. It, it is no one wants to be an island anywhere. You know, you like companies attract other companies. You want to be around like companies and talent wants to come where to a location where they have choices. So I, I think some of those decisions we're making is sometimes focusing in, in on certain area is partly derived to try to get critical mass in that area. All right, thank you. So I wanted to take a, a moment. Um, we are kind of almost into the Q&A section of, of the webinar. Uh, I, I have um, not too many questions up uh, right now. Um, I guess one question came up, um, a New Jersey resident who's a student at Fairfield, um, does he uh, or do they have uh, access to CT's resources? Do you have to actually be a permanent resident of the state of Connecticut or so right now we're actually recruiting for college students through the Governor's Innovation Fellowship. Um, it's for anyone who's graduating this year, graduated last year, and wants to work at a Connecticut company full time. Again, you can live somewhere else. We actually provide an opportunity to connect you with the business. If you're hired by that organization, we give you $5,000 grant. That should cover first and all the last rent. And then we put you in a year long cohort based experience we find with recent grads, it's not only about getting the job, but also retaining that job is easier if you have a community of folks around you. So yes, if you're currently in a college university, that's one of many opportunities that we have for you. Always thinking, and folks on this call said, always thinking about ways to attract and retain our talent here in the state. So I would suggest you look at the ctnext.com or Google CT Next Governor's Innovation Fellowship and please apply. All right. And David, uh, someone made a comment about uh, your your points re um, uh, regarding employability, and uh, wanted to I guess some more elaboration. Yeah. So 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 most entrepreneurship programs focus on creating a startup, uh, and you'll have competitions, you'll have different spaces, et cetera. One of one of the things again to enhance employability within the entrepreneurial firms, we've created what's called Hillside Ventures, a student venture fund that makes uh, 
makes investments in particular verticals. They're some of the most connected <laughs> venture capital students uh, across the across the state. I mean, it's pretty amazing to see what they've done in a short time. But they spend all, uh, up to two years in this program, and they learn how to evaluate uh, companies. They build a network across the country. Uh, they source deals. I think they looked at 500 deals last year, um, and you know they they do these things. So th they're ready to work in a in a high paced entrepreneurial environment where there might only be three other employees. Um, and they might be called on to do any number of things. So providing them the workplace agility and the in the um, the tangible skills to be able to add value at different places uh, is uniquely necessary to the entrepreneurial world, as opposed to I'm coming in and I'm in charge of this spreadsheet and I'm going to make sure I know where every piece of, uh, you know, every screw that's ever, you know, delivered to uh, Lockheed Martin or Secor you know, Sikorsky, that's a totally different animal, right? Uh, <clears throat> that level of niche uh, specialty in a large company versus preparing a student to be nimble and agile and be able to do all the things that are needed or maybe asked of you. And so we try to create those type of real world experiences. Uh, the other piece is they have to last longer than a class period. That's what we call transformative education. When a student takes on something and it goes beyond the, the semester time frame, so that we we see their connectivity across that time, their their investment goes up. It, it impacts them differently and it prepares them much differently than um, you know traditional classrooms. All right, um, Oni, I have a question. Uh, can you provide more details or more thoughts on your five-year plan for CT Next? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, um, we're just in the process of going through any and all of programs to make sure that we have a better idea of what's working, um, what's not working, and changes we can make to do it. Really, I mean, we call it the stoplight. Every week, every Tuesday from 11 to 1, full staff, two hours weekly for the next several weeks going through every single aspect. And one of the big takeaways that we've come through so far is this idea of an investment thesis, right? So if we're building entrepreneurial ecosystems and sectors, then it's not enough for me to say, I wanna see green tech in New London, Groton. So if you pitch an organization or project to me, I'll provide X number of funding for six months. And then you come back to me and say, okay, well, only I met my milestones, I met my KPIs, I wanna be able to continue this project moving forward. I think that short term mentality is exactly why we're, we're so disjointed as an ecosystem and ecosystems across the state. So what I wanna do is look at it by sector and say, what are the opportunities to build up an investment thesis? So for example, food entrepreneurship across the state of Connecticut, if there are organizations who are supporting entrepreneurs on the ground, through accelerators and incubators or hoping to build out a commercial kitchen in their region, why not put together, you know, just throwing out a number, $2 million over the course of three years and allow people to draw down from that funding in order to help their particular program and project. And in doing that, because I'm looking at it at an ecosystem and investment level rather than a project by project level, I have a better idea of who's doing what in what region and how I can connect them and share resources across the regions. So I think the long term or the, the short term change that we're making for a long term impact is really imagine how do we unlock more money at a longer horizon, having leading KPIs so we know what milestones we wanna hit just outside of jobs. And then we can allow the entrepreneurs to really lead the direction of the investment thesis and be able to catalyze their ecosystems as they need. Again, I think the basis of it is transparency and being unapologetic and having an entrepreneurship-led ecosystem. All right, thanks. So uh, we also have a question for someone who uh, is wondering about what's gonna happen in Connecticut um, with crypto. Um, <laughs> what sort of policies is the state gonna put in place? What sort of investments in training um, will CI or, or CTNX make um, 
to support that industry? Uh, maybe I should take a crack at this. So there is uh, currently out there, there's a couple of things. We was actually a working group that's <clears throat> working on cryptocurrency and, and blockchain technologies. And uh, there's something that's uh, sort of floating around similar to what's going on in Wyoming, as for example, is, is sort of a benchmark. We've already done a lot of this. And that's not necessarily mean that the state of Connecticut will become the wild, wild west of, of crypto. But one of the things that is sort of out there and currently, I think, will be considered by the legislature is sort of defining commercial law as it relates to property rights and digital assets, uh, money transmission licenses, and uh, the regulatory sandbox, for example, are a couple of the things that are out there. And, and some of that, you know, is, is how you define it. So, for example, there is uh, SG law that are involved. All of this is sort of going on at this point in time. And um, so I think you're going to see some efforts uh, for small steps that are involved in, in the cryptocurrency area at a legislative level. Um, and of course, you know, Department of Banking, a lot of this is regulated uh, industry. That is more on the regulation side, so to speak. And, and the things, changes in laws that are going to allow for some of that. Um, you know, I think the state of Connecticut through its financial services industry is already involved in a lot of crypto and blockchain technology. Uh, you, know, you know, digital currency is, is something that can be broadly defined. Most credit card companies such as Synchrony are using a form of digital currency. So I think you're gonna see all of that evolving over time. But I do think that you're gonna see some changes in laws in particular that are gonna help define some of this. And, and keep in mind that some of it is also defined by um, the regulators down in Washington versus the state regulators. What type of security is it? Is it a cash security? Is it a tradable security? Is it uh, a security that is regulated by SEC as an example? All of those are, are things that are being considered. All right, thank you. So uh, we are right now over time. Um, Thank you all for, for staying. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Oni. And thank you, David, for your time today. Um, it's been really great to, to uh, hear all this uh, information. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to plug uh, the, our organization. Keep in mind that uh, we do have uh, three more ser uh, webinars or maybe hopefully in-person meetings coming up where we will take a deeper dive into workforce uh, development and uh, acquisition funding um, and uh, building, um, building successful uh, startups. So take a look or uh, keep an eye out for those. Um, all the panelists have uh, agreed to uh, share their email. So I'm going to do that right now as I close out the, the webinar. Um, please visit ctentrepreneursforum.org for uh, up-to-date info on our next series. And again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you all. Thank you.